Mr. Vice President, we're very honored to have you here and to have you as the keynote of our first National Innovation Summit. And we particularly appreciate the efforts you've made to get here and flying in over, overnight. So thank you very much for being with us. MIT clearly is uh, an appropriate site for this first uh, council uh, initiative uh, on innovation. Uh, MIT is clearly a national treasure, both as an educational uh, institution and as a generator of new knowledge. And of course, uh, <clears throat> it's particularly appropriate since Chuck Vest is our vice chair of the, Na of the Council on Competitiveness, uh, representing the academic uh, institutions. And I think, as you know, uh, Mr. Vice President, this council is a unique organization. It's comprised of business, labor, academia uh, leaders uh, of America really working together to improve our nation's uh, competitiveness. And from the beginning, we have recognized that government has a key role in, in that uh, as well, and we have worked closely with them. And we're very pleased that the Clinton administration really recognized this from uh, its uh, beginnings and ha been, has worked closely uh, with us on that. Now, what brings us here today, uh, the members of the council with the governors and the congressional leaders of both parties, as well as uh, members of the uh, <coughs> administration, is really a shared belief that the competitive challenges facing the United States have changed and are changing. A decade ago, uh, the most pressing demands to face companies like Xerox and many of our other companies were to reduce costs, to improve quality, to shorten our product life cycles. And uh, these really were the survival issues uh, of that time. But we have made significant progress on these challenges. Uh, we as a nation are significantly more competitive than we were a decade ago. That is uh, documented in the Council's 10-year uh, report on competitiveness. And we really, I believe, uh, have done this by working together with business, labor, academia, uh, and the government. But we are now facing a world economy that is changing very dramatically. It's becoming more integrated. The information revolution has opened new frontiers. Our competitive nations have noticed our improvement and, in fact, focused on our success and have focused on improving their technology and their innovation process. And as President Clinton and you have eloquently pointed out, it's a new economy in which there's a higher premium than ever on translating new ideas into new products and services that will win in the global markets and support high wages at home. Well, ladies and gentlemen, no one in public life has taken a more visible role and lead than Vice President Gore in trying to understand and respond to the new forces at work. His interest and knowledge of technology and the innovation process I think is well known to all of us, but I think many of us would be surprised at the depth of his knowledge. <clears throat> and uh, I've, I've had this pointed out to me a, a couple times, uh, both uh, in the early days uh, when he was Vice President-elect uh, at the Economic uh, Summit in, in Little Rock, but even more uh, clearly, uh, one time with, with the, the council had sponsored uh, with the Library of Congress uh, a small conference on the Internet and the implications of the Internet. And this was attended by a number of CEOs, a number of uh, government leaders, and a number of technologists. Uh, and I know, speaking for a number of the CEOs in the audience, uh, given the dialogue between the technologists and the vice president, uh, we all went home and said, we better get another tutorial on, uh, on the Internet, because he clearly knows a lot more than we do uh, about that. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, uh, as you know, we are discussing and will discuss more today the 10-year outlook for U.S. innovation and the action steps that could position, uh, could strengthen our position uh, in this regard. And we are very fortunate that our dialogue will be informed by your perspective. And of course, we hope to continue to engage you in a concerted effort after this uh, innovation conference to strengthen our country and strengthen our, our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President, Al Gore. Thank you very much. No, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your kindness. And Paul, thank you for your very generous introduction. I, I've really enjoyed working with you over the years, and I want to say what a personal debt I owe to Paul Allaire for uh, being uh, my tutor 
when I began the reinventing government uh, project for President Clinton, and he and a few others came and gave me some lessons that were absolutely uh, invaluable in uh, getting that started. And um, I want to uh, acknowledge the other leaders of, uh, of this uh, summit here, this meeting. Chuck Vest is a longtime friend and uh, outstanding president of this institution. Bill Hambrecht, chairman of the council, and John Yokelson, uh, president of the Council on uh, Competitiveness. Uh, George Fisher, uh, chairman and CEO of uh, Eastman Kodak. I was just looking at Iridium's latest project, uh, progress uh, yesterday uh, uh, from his former uh, company. Uh, John Young, the uh, founder of the uh, Council, who's uh, met with President Clinton and me on so many occasions and serves as uh, a co-chair of the President's Council on Science and Technology uh, Advisors. And um, Jack Shankman, uh, the vice chair of the council, representing uh, uh, the perspective of labor, and Sandy Fellman, uh, who is uh, is here from the AFT and a, a great uh, friend and and uh, ally, uh, and also to the members of Congress uh, who are here, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my friend Nancy Pelosi, uh, Vernon Ehlers. Uh, and my former colleagues on the Science and Technology Committee, uh, Jim Sensenbrenner and George Brown, uh, who I see through the lights here. I see Jim, and George is here somewhere uh, over here. I served on the House Science and Technology Committee for eight years and uh, learned a lot from these two gentlemen. And uh, we worked together to form a bipartisan support of uh, base of support for research and development and measures to improve the competitiveness of our country, and it's great to, to see them here. Um, to uh, Governor Zell Miller of uh, Georgia and Governor John Engler of Michigan, thank you to uh, very much. Uh, I'll have uh, another uh, reference to Governor Miller in, uh, in a moment. I want to especially thank uh, Dan Golden, who, as you heard from his presentation a moment ago, is a real visionary. And he and I have uh, worked together since I presided over his confirmation hearings when I was on the Senate uh, Science Subcommittee, a uh, part of the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, and uh, back in the last uh, administration. And we have had a, a wonderful working relationship, and uh, he does a, a truly outstanding job. And I want to acknowledge our former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, who's around here somewhere, and uh, a great partner and friend. And there are all kinds of other distinguished uh, guests I probably ought to to uh, acknowledge, but uh, I don't know to, to, to do it without accidentally missing people, so I'll just go right on to what I have to say here. And I'd like to start that by telling you what a pleasure it is to be back with the Council on Competitiveness. And it's great to be back here at, at MIT. I haven't spoken here in almost two years. Uh, it'll be two years ago, June, when I was asked to give the commencement address. I really enjoyed that. And I told the story at that time about uh, a great tragedy that occurred uh, when uh, the founder of MIT, after uh, 20 years after his retirement, came back in 1882 to deliver the commencement address. And it's a true story. Right in the middle of his speech, he dropped dead. <laughs> now, you see, you're laughing. <laughs> but as terrible as that is, I was, uh, I, I noted then, I was comforted by the fact that no matter how I performed, I would be remembered as only the second stiffest speaker in the uh, history of those commencement addresses. And I can't, I can't get away from that. I, I, you know, the Academy Awards are coming up, and uh, Goodwill Hunting, uh, uh, which takes place at MIT, is among uh, the, the nominees. Anyway, last year when they had the Academy Awards, it made a real impression on me because my wife Tipper and I were propped up on pillows in the bed watching the telecast, and Billy Crystal, the host, came out with, uh, to start the show with a, an Oscar on the podium. And he mentioned that there were so many people nominated and only a few would win, he cautioned uh, them against disappointment. And he looked right into the camera, and he said, remember, the only person who's guaranteed to wake up tomorrow morning with a statue is Tipper Gore.
As Groucho Marx once said, I resemble that remark. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm very grateful to this Council on Competitiveness for convening this critical national summit and very grateful for the important work you have done for so long, and especially during this past year, because you've been helping us understand the dramatic changes that are taking place throughout our economy and throughout our society, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. And as someone with a longtime interest in innovation and its considerable economic benefits, I, I have followed the work of this council since its founding a dozen years ago. You all came uh, uh, back when uh, others were in uh, your positions now and uh, testified before our House uh, Science and Technology Committee. And Jim and George and I uh, uh, had interchanges back then. You've shaped policy for a long time. Uh, I remember in chairing the Senate Science Subcommittee, we frequently had uh, testimony from this council. And over the years, uh, like water on stone, you have uh, worn away some of the resistance you encountered at first, and we've still got a ways to go as a nation, as you continue to point out very forcefully, but we are making some changes, and under President Clinton's leadership, we've seen uh, some pretty significant changes. But um, the fundamental reality remains, our economy is now driven by innovation. And as Michael Porter's uh, talk and study pointed out, other nations are really moving rapidly to take advantage of the new ability to innovate that is out there. Uh, we are obviously at the dawn of a true innovation age. Uh, it's almost a cliche to point out the sequence from agriculture to industry to information, but the change is accelerating. Consider these facts. It's estimated that the entire store of human knowledge now doubles every five years. For example, we're just a few years away from the complete sequencing of the human genome, giving us for the very first time a kind of instruction manual for the human body. When that human genome is completed, it will have a gestalt effect. The whole will be considerably larger and more important than the sum of its parts, just as the Internet, when it was completed to the point where everyone could connect into it, acquired a, a significance uh, far larger than the incremental advance uh, uh, that completed the last uh, uh, accessibility. Uh, in the same way, we're going to see a whole uh, revolution in uh, genetics uh, and biotechnology even beyond what is going on right now when the human genome is finally completed. And it's so, uh, it's so close. Within a couple of years, microchips will routinely contain one billion transistors per chip, the size of a fingernail. And the patterns etched onto them will be as complex and complicated as the roadmap for the entire planet. That's difficult to to comprehend, and the implications are, of course, vast. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Iridium uh, from uh, George's old company. Within six months, I think they've got uh, 42 satellites up now. The constellation of 66 will be rounded out in early September. They'll have a couple of weeks of uh, shakeout time. By the end of September this year, it will be possible to make a cell cellular telephone call from any point on the surface of this planet to any other point on the surface of this planet. And soon after, there will be multiple competing systems offering the same service. Within three years, it will be possible to receive from any point on the surface of this planet information flows of six and a half gigabits compared to like 36 million bits uh, uh, necessary for uh, faxes and pagers and telephone service, it will be possible to get six and a half gigabits, six and a half billion bits of information flowing down uh, remotely, wireless, to any place on the surface of the Earth. What that means is that access to the information superhighway will be available from the sands of the Kalahari, from the top of Mount Everest, from any place on the surface 
of the earth. Now, what are the implications? Obviously, they're so uh, vast uh, that uh, it's impossible to predict what that will happen. Nobody could predict all of the changes that flowed from the invention of the printing press and the ubiquitous availability of uh, information to average citizens when books could be printed, when it's possible to have full internet access for all of the five and a half, by then six, uh, uh, almost six billion people uh, on, on this uh, planet, the, uh, the consequences are going to be really uh, staggering. We're on the verge of fulfilling a vision outlined by uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in the middle of the last century. Fifteen years after the invention of the telegraph, he wrote these words. By means of electricity, the world of matter has become a great nerve, vibrating thousands of miles in a breathless point of time. The round globe is a vast brain, instinct with intelligence. Often it's easy to chart the exact benefits of a new breakthrough to our health care, to uh, uh, our pocketbooks, to our hard disk drives. But today I'd like to briefly talk about innovation in a broader context. Uh, and to talk about innovation not merely as a material goal, but as an ethic, a constant concern, a continuing focus for our entire country. Some of you, uh, as managers, are familiar with the, uh, the phrase learning organization. Some of you manage uh, toward that objective. We as a nation must be a learning nation. We have to put into place the infrastructure, the policies, the programs, and the habits that enable us to continue innovating at an accelerating rate. MIT's motto, men's at manus, mind and hand, sums up this challenge. True innovation encompasses not only the labor of our hands, but also the labor of our minds. Increasingly, of course, brain replaces brawn. And if American industry is to continue growing and thriving and remaining competitive, we must be willing to think and act anew to keep pushing the boundaries of knowledge and discovery and to reshape our economy by redefining the way we view our world. Thomas Kuhn uh, wrote a path-breaking study many years ago about the way revolutions in thought occur. All of a sudden, new observations, new findings about the world uh, uh, don't fit into the old models that we're using. And then uh, slowly, these uh, unexplainable observations accumulate to the point where the old model doesn't work anymore. And then, all of a sudden, someone comes up with an innovative new pattern that explains the, un the previously unexplainable and produces a new vision into which all of the information that was mysterious in the past fits neatly. At a few precious moments in our history, we see this occur uh, in a dramatic way. Um, more than 500 years ago, uh, Columbus set sail. And obviously, by discovering the new world, he gave us a new vision of Earth. Copernicus was 19 years old when Columbus landed in the New World. And w just a few years uh, after that, just a couple of decades uh, after that, rather, uh, he produced the new model explaining not only the Earth, but its relationship to the solar system in a new way. A century after Columbus, Galileo first turned the new instrument of the telescope toward the sky and shattered centuries-old notions about the mechanics of our solar system. And obviously, the, I mean, I saw a cartoon uh, recently, maybe it was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, about uh, with the Columbus uh, uh, speaking to Queen Isabella and saying, uh, not only will we find spices, this will create 3,000 new jobs. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, I think sometimes we, uh, we sound like that a little bit, and uh, for obvious reasons. But um, the discoveries coming out of the age of exploration unleashed the greatest explosion of trade and commerce the, the world had ever seen. 
New lands brought new ideas and the need for new inventions. Europe's contact with other cultures and customs, while uh, uh, not always mutually positive, stimulated new thinking in the old world. Now, half a millennium after Columbus, in our time, we broke free from the gravitational pull of the Earth with the Apollo program. And we went to explore the surface of the moon. But in doing so, we dramatically changed the way we viewed ourselves and our own planet. Uh, Dan knows uh, that in, in my office in the, in the White House, my, my office is down the hall from the Oval Office. I, I work in the famous Square Office in the, in, in the White House. <laughs> And on the, uh, on the wall is a, is a photograph of the uh, Earth uh, that was taken on December 7, 1972, by the very last Apollo mission to the moon. It is the most printed photograph in the history of humankind. The people who keep up with those things say the next closest photograph is not even close. I remember when the Apollo 8 mission first circled the moon before Apollo 11 landed. And the image of the Earth from space had a dramatic impact. Some people anticipated that. The great British astrophysicist Fred Hoyle predicted in 1948 in these words, once a photograph of the Earth taken from outside is available, once the sheer isolation of the Earth becomes plain, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. Of course, it wasn't until the Apollo missions exactly 20 years later that we found out the truth of that prophecy. Like a child's first glimpse of herself in a mirror, those photographs changed our own self-image. We saw a world that was not as vast or expansive or incomprehensible as we had thought, but surprisingly smaller, more interconnected, and more fragile. The poet Archibald MacLeish wrote of those images, to see the earth as we see it now, small and blue and beautiful in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as writers on the earth together brothers on the bright loveliness in the unending night, brothers who see now they are truly brothers. This new image, this new way of integrating knowledge shifted centuries of human understanding and brought about dramatic results. Certainly such a quantum leap in our worldview does not occur all that often, but when it does, it sometimes takes decades to know where the leap is taking us. And in that spirit, it's not that different from the work that many of you do each and every day, pushing the ever-expanding boundaries of knowledge and discovery, creating and innovating for the ultimate benefit of all of our people. At its heart, what innovation means is looking at the world in new and different ways. Our challenge is to create the right climate for that kind of innovation, both large and small, and to harness its enormous economic potential for the 21st century. You've already come a long way, and with help from so many of you, our nation is building a new economy, one that takes innovation as its starting point, not as a mere byproduct. The new economy is driven by innovation, Information and technology are its fuels. The new economy values the productivity and creativity of people above all else. Yesterday, uh, I had long sessions in Silicon Valley with the Prime Minister of Russia, Viktor Chernomyrdin, and the CEOs of many of the leading high technology firms. Uh, uh, some of you all uh, couldn't be there because you were on your way here for this uh, for this meeting, Bill Perry uh, was one in that uh, category. Bill Hambrick, there's some others. But uh, we had uh, quite a representation from the high-tech community there. And they made it plain to the leadership of Russia what we already know. 
which is that by far the most valuable resource or asset that any nation has is the unused creativity and brain power of the men and women in that nation. Russia has more PhDs per capita than any nation on the face of this earth. You talk about uh, an innovation policy, uh, they need one. Uh, and we do too. And there, there are um, a lot of things that it is now obvious with this new worldview we need to be doing right now. The new economy is connected to the global marketplace where we zap dollars and data around the world at the speed of light. Now, today, we do have some things going for us. The American economy is once again the envy of the world. Uh, interest rates and inflation are at record lows. Investment and modernization are both rising. We have 15 million new jobs, the lowest unemployment in a generation. And today, a full third of our GDP growth now comes from information technology. Our fast-growing environmental technology industry is already bigger than our steel industry, textile industry, or aerospace industry. More Americans build semiconductors now than construction machinery. More Americans spend their days processing data than refining petroleum. More Americans now build computers than build cars. Perhaps more importantly, today there is left less difference between the task of building a computer and building a car. Open up a car and it doesn't look a lot different than some computers. Today's Ford Taurus has more computing power than those Apollo spacecraft in the 1960s and, and 70s. And those that build cars do so in ways that emphasize quality, performance, and innovation. Part of what we used to call, and some still call, the Japanese challenge came about because they figured out how to innovate new generations of products like cars in a much shorter period of time. They, they took the lead time from the idea for a new car uh, from that point to the appearance of the new car from seven years down to five years down to three years. And there's a great race on now to get that process down to, to one year. Some of the technologies that Dan Golden uh, referred to will be important in that process. Already uh, in the aircraft manufacturing industry, Boeing is leading the entire world because it has figured out how to use some of the new information technologies to compress that development period down to the bare minimum. The 777, as many of you know, was created without any paper to speak of, completely in digital form. And the maintenance can be done uh, digitally as well. Uh, they're telescoping that lead time from idea to the appearance of the product really uh, uh, across the board. And our own automobile industries, uh, companies, are, are now on the verge of creating the largest, most powerful extra net uh, in, in the world to connect with their suppliers and subcontractors and move toward uh, digital paperless uh, information flows in the development of new vehicles. We are working with the big three in the partnership for a new generation of vehicles to move beyond the internal combustion engine toward a new generation of vehicles that will have much higher levels of efficiency, uh, will be much more cost competitive with much uh, lower levels uh, of pollution among the other advantages. Now, these two examples illustrate the convergence of technologies that is now giving us the ability to get productivity gains from computers long after their initial introduction. We know from history that sometimes uh, innovations are exciting and obviously important, but don't bring any measurable improvements in productivity for quite some time. Some of you are uh, familiar with uh, the example of what happened when new electric motors were in invented and introduced. People thought that they would uh, bring improvements in productivity, but they didn't. 
at least not for a while. Why? Because the context into which they were introduced had not changed in order to accommodate the new potential. The old factories uh, from the industrial age uh, were designed for steam engines, and that meant that uh, many of them were uh, highly, highly vertical uh, with uh, uh, conveyor belts and loops coming off the, uh, the, the central source of power in the middle of the factory. When they retrofitted factories like that with small electric motors, the inherent efficiencies in the electric motors w couldn't be seen anywhere. But over time, that those physical plants wore out, new factories were built and designed in a way that accommodated the inherent efficiencies of that new technology. And so after a long delay, all of a sudden there was a surge in productivity because the inherent adv advantages were able to be expressed in the new context that was created. I think we're seeing something exactly like that now with the delayed productivity gains from the introduction of microprocessors and computers and networks as businesses and industries now redesign their physical plants and more importantly their processes and their human interactions in ways that take advantage of the new abilities conferred by microprocessing. That's why I sometimes uh, wonder about uh, the measurements that are used on innovation and productivity. We have to make do with what measurements uh, we can get our hands on. But this is inherently a very inexact process. And those of you who've uh, spent a long time uh, uh, studying productivity know that it's just, uh, the, the studies are just a mess. There are just so many factors uh, involved, and some people will have great precision in saying this or that about it, and, and uh, we, again, we have to work with the information available. But sometimes uh, you can introduce some new uh, capacities that you know are going to fuel a surge in productivity, even if it's not measured for a while. Look at the Internet. Uh, when we started, uh, providing seed money in the Congress more than 20 years ago for the development of what is now the Internet, there was, there was no enthusiasm in the business community for it because it was, it was not relevant to the way business operated at the time. Now, of course, every uh, business has its own web page and uh, whole uh, industries are being redesigned in order to take uh, full advantage of the abilities uh, of the Internet. When President Clinton and I took office, there were only 50 sites on the World Wide Web. That hadn't been that long ago, just five, a little over five years ago. And now, of course, millions and, and millions, and the increase is uh, ge geometric. It is, um, it is an example of a new capacity a new way of linking together, a new convergence, a new way of seeing the world that after a delay produces a surge of productivity. In fact, uh, if you think back on that example of the uh, electric motors, what happened there was when alternating current was invented, it made it, made it possible to distribute electricity over a much wider area, and, and then it was possible with electric motors to distribute the sources of mechanical energy throughout the factory and co-locate them precisely where each machine needed the mechanical energy. In exactly that same way, what the Internet is making possible is a new form of distributed intelligence, distributed knowledge, distributed information, and all of the old organizational structures, which like those vertical factories uh, based on uh, steam engines, uh, relied on a, a, a central repository for knowledge with all the decisions having to go to that central place. Now, 
the knowledge is distributed widely and easily. And ge geographic boundaries are not uh, uh, as significant as they once were. Um, Microsoft uh, has a contract in India for uh, maintenance and service so that when you call uh, uh, the number, they may take care of it in Seattle, or without knowing it, you may be talking uh, to someone in, in India over the Internet uh, and receiving the information uh, seamlessly as if uh, it was uh, uh, coming from Redmond, Washington. Uh, and, and of course, many of you here could give um, similar examples. But the point is, today's technology is allowing us to unlock a much higher fraction of that unused creativity uh, among men and women all over uh, our nation. And we're able to reach out to those who, in previous years, would have been left out of the world of innovation. Now we never know where we will find the person responsible for the next intellectual breakthrough. It could be a janitor right here at MIT. You can't, uh, you can't ever tell. Some of you saw the movie. Um, there's simply no question that if we want to make the most of the 21st century and this new economy, if we want to achieve the full promise of American business, we have to do everything we can to fuel new innovation and discovery, build partnerships that encourage, support, and reward cutting-edge ideas, and keep our economy strong enough and efficient enough to take advantage of them as quickly uh, as possible. Uh, along with my colleagues, I've worked on initiatives uh, uh, to try to take advantage of these new realities, uh, the Small Business Innovation Research uh, Initiative, the first legislation uh, which led to the Internet, the first funding uh, uh, for the Human Genome Project, and the rest. And over the past five years, under President Clinton's leadership, we have done an enormous amount to encourage innovation. For a, for a quarter of a century, the number of patent applications for inventions by Americans hovered between 60,000 and 70,000 per year. That was true for most of the 1980s. The past few years have seen that number jump up to above 100,000. Similarly, we've increased the number of patent awards by 50 percent from the early 1980s. We plan to seize that promise by continuing the bold new economic strategy that we believe is partly responsible for the surge of strength in the new economy, eliminating the deficit, opening up new markets to our products, and investing more in education, technology, job training, and uh, environmental protection, and other efforts which help to secure our future. Uh, on the first point, <clears throat> we will balance the budget and we'll, we will do it this year. The budget the President just proposed to Congress takes a deficit that used to have 11 zeros and makes it simply zero. That is very important when you look at access to credit. Uh, it's an old story uh, uh, to describe what it was like for companies to compete in credit markets with the 800-pound gorilla that had to get uh, $300 billion or, uh, a year or, or more in order to finance uh, the federal deficit. So we made tough choices based on hard numbers and freed up hundreds of billions of dollars in capital to finance private investments, including research and development. <clears throat> and one of the other reasons for our emphasis on eliminating the deficit is not only uh, the competition in credit markets, but also the simple fact that in this new economy, we're not on the gold standard, we're on the information standard. And we get a premium in world credit markets and finance markets when they see uh, that the economy is being managed well. Investment capital is flowing toward the United States. We're seeing uh, an expression of confidence all over the world in U.S. markets. We need to uh, go further and increase the savings rate. That's a very complicated challenge, as your counsel has made clear over the years, but we must do our best to meet that challenge. Now, the second component of our economic strategy, after having a sound uh, fiscal policy, is to keep on opening markets for American products overseas. Ninety-six percent of the consumers in the world live in other countries. That's why we've signed more than 200 new trade agreements in the past few years, uh, and we're pushing hard uh, for the authority to enter into yet more trade agreements. We're also aggressively addressing unfair trade practices 
by other nations. We're insisting upon the protection of intellectual property rights. I just had lengthy discussions with Prime Minister Chairman Mirden over the last three days, uh, for example, on that point. And we're putting in place mechanisms uh, to help to address the concerns of at-risk workers uh, as we move ever farther into this global marketplace. The third part of our economic strategy is making those targeted investments in the future. Uh, and that means, first and foremost, dramatically improving our K through 12 education system. Uh, and that's why we're, uh, after hiring 100,000 new uh, uh, police officers to help bring the crime rate down, we're now proposing measures to hire 100,000 new high quality teachers to reduce classroom sizes. That's why we're trying to connect every single classroom and library to the information superhighway. That's why we're trying to finance the construction and renovation of crumbling classrooms and school buildings all over the United States. That's why we're pushing national standards for, for math and reading. That's why we're setting specific national goals. That's why we're calling for voluntary national tests. You can ask any classroom of students uh, whether or not they study harder if they know the test is coming up. And the answer is, of course, yes. Well, if we have tests against which we can measure progress or the lack of progress, we're going to have an easier time figuring out whether we're moving in the right direction or whether we're moving in the wrong direction. We have to invest in the improvements to our education system. We've already freed up uh, more money for access to higher education than at any time since the passage of the GI Bill. Uh, and we, we uh, are addressing the problems uh, in our job training system. We've called, uh, as part of the initial Reinventing Government report, we call for the elimination of all of the various and complicated job training programs and the replacement of all of them with a voucher system uh, to, to uh, really streamline the job training marketplace. I want to say that I encourage every single one of you to look closely at an innovation that Governor Zell Miller has put in place in Columbus, Georgia, called the IPAC mechanism that brings together universities, community leaders, and the business community to dramatically change uh, higher education uh, in a technical school format to produce highly relevant, sophisticated skills that are immediately redeemable in the marketplace. It is uh, the single most innovative model that I have seen. And of course, we uh, took the Hope Scholarship uh, model from uh, Governor Miller. Now we're stealing this uh, from him. We're trying to give him credit for it, uh, like we did the Hope Scholarships. But I really encourage you all uh, to look at that. Now, uh, investing in the future also means investing in research and development. That's why we're proposing the 21st Century Research Fund, to have the largest increases by far in funding for the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the National uh, Cancer Institute, and our other research uh, institutions that we've ever had in American history. We believe that in the innovation age, basic research must be financed by the people of this country through the institutions of self-government, simply because of the obvious reason that for-profit enterprises, because of competition, are necessarily going to have to focus on uh, research that has more immediate applications. Uh, and, and that's why we're investing uh, not just in targeted research, but also in the undirected research that often yields the largest uh, long-term gains. Uh, of course, that it takes private sector investment as well. And we have to understand that uh, even though there are new efficiencies in research and development with, with computational science and the internet, uh, the new advantages that supercomputers give, still the basic costs for research and development are increasing. And so uh, we've proposed an extension of America's $2.2 billion research and experimentation tax credit, which is critical to our most innovative industries. And we're encouraging other policies that free up more funding for private research and development. Now, uh, part of our strategy is also to unshackle the dynamism of the new economy by freeing it from the heavy hand of old, outdated, 
obsolete government practices. I've referred a couple of times to uh, reinventing government. I'll give you a couple of, an, of examples. We're fighting uh, to streamline the patent law, and we've proposed to take the patent office and make it what we call a performance-based organization, to get rid of the bureaucracy of the past, the red tape, the regulations, have a CEO, have performance measures, have strict accountability, set it up uh, as a performance-based organization and let it go. Uh, we, we think by focusing on results and giving increased flexibility to uh, managers and making other specific changes, we can bring about the kind of transformation in government organizations that many of you have brought about in your private companies. Already we have uh, reduced the size of the federal government by 350,000 people in the last five years. It is now smaller in size than it has been since 1961, the first year of President John Kennedy's uh, uh, administration. And it's smaller as a percentage of the workforce uh, than it was since before the New Deal. We've eliminated two, 200 outdated government programs, eliminated more than 16,000 pages of red tape, saved $137 billion uh, in the process. But we need further improvements in regulatory reform and in legal reform. We need to advance rapidly by using these new understandings uh, and new techniques. Now, we're paying special attention to the growth and development of the Internet. We believe that the uh, new economy is in many ways an Internet economy. We have an aggressive strategy to foster electronic commerce. Trade and commerce on the Internet are now uh, tripling every year. And in just a few years, we will be generating hundreds of billions of dollars in the sales of goods and services. We want to ensure the establishment of an environment in which electronic commerce can grow and flourish so that every computer can be a window open to every business, large and small, everywhere in the world. That means minimal government, no new taxes, and no cumbersome regulation. That's why we're working to make the Internet a global free trade zone to take advantage of its full potential for stimulating prosperity. And our 21st Century Research Fund invests hundreds of millions of dollars to help speed up the development of the next generation Internet, which will have data flows more than a thousand times greater than the present Internet. And soon after that, we will increase it by another thousand fold. Uh, just imagine what the next generation can help us achieve with data moving a thousand times faster and having that wireless access all over the globe just three years from now. I believe this overall approach is one that will definitely improve America's future competitiveness. And I wish to give credit to this council for generating many of the, the basic ideas upon which uh, our strategy has been based. This dialogue you've been having with our nation over the last dozen years has really been paying off. And I encourage you to continue uh, the kind of forward thinking uh, that you have been up to. Um, before I close, I'd like to say uh, that today I want to issue a specific challenge that I hope will uh, advance uh, the discovery process and give us a little bit richer understanding of the world that we inhabit. I referred at the beginning of my speech uh, to Columbus's voyage. According to historians, a Spanish sailor named Rodrigo de Triana was standing in the forecastle of the Pinta, Columbus's ship, and was the first person to see the new world. Today, a clearer view of our own world could help us reach new heights of understanding. And that's why today I'm proposing that NASA launch a satellite named Triana, which will provide the very first continuous live images of the entire Earth from space. It will bring into the digital age those remarkable pictures we received of our Earth a generation ago. You know, that picture I referred to was taken 26 years ago. There hasn't been one since then. Actually, there was for a brief moment a short video of the Earth as the uh, Galileo spacecraft was speeding away from the Earth and it turned around and focused it ca its uh, cameras on the Earth. And for just a few seconds, we were able to see uh, 
for just a short time, I should say, when it was speeded up, uh, uh, the, the film is very short, but then it was gone. And the reason we don't have any other pictures is that images from Earth orbit, even from uh, the geosynchronous uh, orbit 22,300 miles high, just allows us to see a tiny part of the Earth's surface. The angle uh, interferes with our ability to see the entire planet as you would from that simulated view. Um, I'd like to, to uh, show this uh, video illustrating the, uh, the idea behind this uh, satellite that I'm challenging uh, NASA to launch. The first uh, picture in this video is the one that I described from uh, December of 1972 on the Apollo 17 mission. You can see Antarctica at the bottom. It's the last picture we've had of the Earth, uh, except, as I mentioned, uh, for this brief, stunning imagery as the Galileo sp spacecraft left the Earth. Wouldn't it be nice to have that image continuous, live, 24 hours a day? Uh, we can understand weather systems better if we do. Now we'll be able to, with this project, which will launch this small satellite from the space shuttle bay, uh, that's one of the options, and then it will be sped toward a point in space between, beyond the moon, between the Earth and the sun. The sun, as you know, is 96 million miles away, one million miles from the Earth, just shy of that, there is a point called the L1 point where the gravitational fields of the Earth and Sun cancel each other out. And this satellite can be positioned there to focus a high definition television camera on the Earth and send images down to students by way of the internet. We'll be able to study the movement of weather systems in a brand new way. Uh, understanding, our understanding of phenomena like uh, El Nino can be vastly improved if we can see farther into the Pacific Ocean where the storms uh, develop. This is a, this is a, uh, a, a imagery that is very difficult to piece together from the current weather satellites. Th this, that's digitally uh, stitched together from a lot of different geosynchronous uh, weather satellites. It'll come down to three uh, uh, university-based uh, Earth stations and then made available worldwide uh, through the Internet. And the launch will take place in less than uh, two years uh, if this uh, uh, is successful, we will have live 24-hour-a-day coverage uh, of the Earth uh, within less than two years. I believe that um, this can have tremendous scientific value uh, and help us to understand uh, the emergence of global weather patterns uh, and help us in, in a lot of other ways. As Socrates said 2,500 years ago, Man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lived. In different words, uh, a former friend of some of us here, the astronaut uh, Rusty Schweikert, once described what he felt during the Apollo uh, uh, series when he was orbiting the moon. And he said, you realize that on that small spot, that little blue and white thing is everything that matters to you, all of history and music and poetry and art and war and death and birth and love, tears, joy, games, all of it is on that little spot out there that you can cover with your thumb. With Triana, that same experience could be available to uh, all of us. And uh, as Columbus is reputed to have said, it will also produce 3,000 jobs. Daniel Borston, the great former librarian of Congress, wrote, uh, the most promising words ever written on the maps of human knowledge are terra incognita, unknown territory. That's true of our ability to understand the Earth, our effort to understand uh, the new economy. It's true of your efforts to understand how we can stimulate more innovation in the United States of America. I'm proud to say that President Clinton and I are ready and willing partners in the effort to stimulate more innovation in the U.S. economy. We will do everything we can to keep growth and innovation high and productivity strong. So let us continue to blaze new paths to American competitiveness, continue to search for uncharted territories, be they near or far. And in the spirit of this great institution, 
let us apply our hands and our minds and our hearts to that endeavor. For that is how we will build the 21st century and the new economy of our dreams. Thank you very much.